playing South Dakota Mines on Friday and Black Hill State on Saturday. The men's basketball team is also home this weekend playing South Dakota Mines on Friday and Black Hill State on Saturday. Both men's and women's games will be this weekend in the Burns Arena. More scores, news, highlights, and more. Tune into Radio Dixie 91.3. What's up, sports fans? I'm Easton Smith with your weekly Dixie State sports update. Starting off with your Dixie State women's soccer team who are still alive in the NCAA tournament where they play this Thursday against Dallas Baptist. Over to the women's basketball team where they have a homestand this weekend playing South Dakota Mines on Friday and Black Hill State on Saturday. The men's basketball team is also home this weekend playing South Dakota Mines on Friday and Black Hill State on Saturday. Both men's and women's games will be this weekend in the Burns Arena. More scores, news, highlights, and more. Tune into Radio Dixie 91.3. We're not always here, but email's a great way to contact us. Radio St. George at gmail.com. A request, a comment, an idea, or more. Radio St. George at gmail.com. Thank you for listening to Radio St. George at 100.3 FM. This is KDXI St. George, Radio St. George at 100.3 FM. And we now present to you On the Arts, an hour of discussion and discovery about the arts in St. George and Southern Utah. And now your hosts for On the Arts, Michael and Christina Harding. Good afternoon, St. George. This is Michael Harding. Again, I apologize for Christina not being here. She is on her last class of teaching those youngsters the arts. So she won't be joining me today, but I do want to let you know that On the Arts will be returning after the holiday break for season five of On the Arts. I'm happy to say this will be our final broadcast for this year, for 2019. But again, we will come back on January 7th at 4 o'clock p.m., Tuesday, January 7th, and we'll continue to talk about the arts. Now, just a reminder as to what it is that we do here. On the Arts is about blowing the lid off of all of these little artistic secrets that we have here in St. George and Southern Utah in general. And I think it's become very clear over the last four seasons that it's not just the secrets of the art itself, but the secrets of the people that are here. We have a lot of talent here in Southern Utah, people who have a wide range of experience, whether they be dancers or actors or directors or film producers or film directors or writers, ceramicists, painters, a lot of people here with a lot of experience that up to this point, have been kind of hiding in the shadows for the most part, and it's been a real pleasure getting to know them on this show, On the Arts. So that is the purpose here. Now, I'm happy to say we have a guest who's here on a topic that I know relatively little about. We've had several filmmakers on the show. We had Trey Patterson, who has made quite a few local films, but we actually had him on, in uh, most part, the capacity of being a magician. We've also had Dan Falks on. Uh, Dan has done many, many films around the area, and he's working on several different venues. And we also have had Adam Mast several times here in the studio, where we've talked about movies in general, but we haven't really gotten into the technical aspect of putting films together. Now, I mentioned that I personally, as an actor, have relatively little experience on film. I am a stage actor. Most of what I do is rather big for the camera. And uh, my first experience in front of a camera was actually for an R.C. Willie commercial up north. This was back in, oh my gosh, it must have been back in 1998. When I was living up there for the first time, I was working at Pioneer Theater Company and decided I was going to do a little film work, commercial work, just to bring in some extra bucks. Well, I remember I was so excited to do R.C. Willie, you know, a, a, a nationally recognized chain and such. And I got in there, and that director, if you're listening, I don't even remember your name, but if you are listening right now, if you're in our, let's hope, in the double digits audience right now, uh, if you are listening, I apologize for what I put you through that day as a young actor. Uh, he was very, very polite, but he yelled very politely, and he kept saying, don't move your head. And I kept saying, I'm not, I'm really not moving my head at all. But when I looked at myself on the monitor, when he played it back for me, my head was all over the place. It's because I'm used to being on stage. You can get away with a lot on stage that you cannot in front of the camera. And I have to say, or I'm happy to say that I've gotten better at it, but I'm still not 
known as the technically proficient camera actor. Now, I do have a few films under my belt, if you will, but please know that the films I've been involved with have either gone direct to video or did not finish. Maybe I destroyed them. I don't know. One was uh, a film called Chrome, and it was up in Seattle, and I got hired as Colonel Zet. I'll never forget this. It was this futuristic robot apocalypse movie, and it was in that that I kept being called out on my tendency to go, hi, mom, when I was on set when I was filming a scene. And he kept saying, stop looking at the camera. He called it uh, a hi mom moment. And I said, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. You will learn a lot about yourself if you're on camera, by the way. And uh, he showed me that as I was being pulled across the stage by uh, a, a wonderful young actress named Katie Tomlinson, but she was playing the robot called Chrome. And she was about four and a half feet tall. And I had to act as if she were flinging me about. It was wonderful. Uh, I was incredibly bruised up, but incredibly exhilarated at the end of that shoot. And he showed me that as I would pass the camera, my eyes would dart towards it. I had absolutely no idea. I was not doing it uh, on purpose to say hello to the camera or anything. I felt a little bit like Lucille Ball and I Love Lucy, where she actually drew the name of or her name on the bottom of her shoes so people would recognize who she was. But it was this subtle little thing, and I am amazed at what the camera picks up and how difficult it truly is to be an actor who, this is, gonna, this is a paradox of acting, but how difficult it is to not work in a difficult fashion to make sure that you're giving a performance that the camera can pick up on that's not too big for the camera, that is telling a story that is real and genuine and perfect for that size medium. Now, uh, my guest in the studio is Ben Brayton here. Uh, as he pointed out earlier, it's spelled B-R-A-T-E-N, so it looks like Bratton, but it sounds like Satan. I will not make any uh, any comparisons on that. Just a, a little bit about Ben and my relationship with Ben. He teaches here at Dixie State University as well. In fact, if you look at his bio, he's look he's listed as a digital film producer and instructor. And I'm happy to say that all of the students that I've worked with who have worked with him on putting together films and such have had a pretty good time. I will say some of them have just as I learned about some of my deficiencies as a performer in front of the camera, some of them discovered their deficiencies behind the camera, and they had different <laughs> uh, reactions to how they were shown this. But we have Ben in the studio. Ben, welcome to On the Arts. Thank you. Thanks for uh, inviting me. This is fun. Absolutely. This, uh, Like I said, the, the whole point of this show, well, not the whole point, a big part of it is, of course, to introduce artists in Southern Utah to people in Southern Utah so that they get an opportunity to understand who's around here. But it's actually, on a very personal note, been beneficial for myself. Hmm. I've gotten to know a lot of people that otherwise I would not have. Yeah, and I bet, yeah. Had the opportunity to chat. And, and it is a community that, I mean, I don't know what it is that people like to come here retire here, just move here just to, to be away from the, the hustle and the bustle, the insanity of, well, in the filmmaking world, California, they'll come here, they buy houses and we don't know, they they live here and that's probably by design, you know, on, on their part because they just want to get away. But it turns out there are a lot, a lot of really, really talented people here. So it's fun. Yeah. I'll tell you the Kayenta Center for Performing Arts yeah. and that Kayenta community. Mm -hmm. Holy cow. You talk about going out into the desert and maybe flipping up a rock to see a scorpion or mm -hmm. something. You could go out there and flip up a rock to look for artists. There yeah. are a oh. lot of retirees there yep. with a lot of experience. Yeah, it's packed. It's amazing. Well, tell me, Ben, who the heck are you? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I am <laughs> nobody. Uh, oh, boy. It's, it, that's, that's a good, you know, that's something I, I get up in the morning and look in the mirror and ask myself that just right. on a daily basis. Yeah. Who are you? Why are you? Well, that's, that, that's, that's big, the bigger question. Why am I? Um, and I'm trying to justify that, you know, every day too. Um, oh boy. Well, I, I've, I've worked here. I just, I was uh, given a, uh, a certificate. Well, it was, it was a plaque. It was awarded a, a plaque, uh, this year for being here for 10 years, mm -hmm. uh, this year. It was actually, I've been here for 11, but the first year I worked effectively for free. I didn't have a paycheck, mm -hmm. so I, I didn't come on as an actual uh, employee. That never uh, happens in the No, arts. no. Uh, and uh, anyway, so yeah, I've been here for a little over 10 years working in this capacity. Well, a variety of capacities, but uh, for the most part, it's been kind of this, um, a multifaceted uh, thing that I, I've 
worked here as an instructor and also a producer slash director slash uh, director of photography slash camera operator slash steady cam operator slash editor slash sound design all, everything you know after effects um, you just in, in a smaller market um, where gosh there's you, you want to be able to do fun stuff and, and, and kind of elevate the, the quality and the level of what you're putting out there you just kind of have to learn how to do all these different things and uh, fortunately we live in an age where a lot, most of that information is available, like a click of a mouse or a button, and mm -hmm. and so you, um, you just kind of educate yourself, and uh, and then in turn educate students and and whatnot. And it's this grand circle, but it yeah, for the most part, it's it's a lot of work, but but a lot of fun at the same time. So yeah, I've been doing that for ten years. Um, I've had a chance to make. Uh, Lots and lots of commercials, music videos, documentaries, lots of documentaries, um, and then little narrative shorts, short films, things like that, and then lots of stuff just for the school. Right. But uh, it, it's it, you run the entire gamut, um, educational things. I mean, we've done stuff for Zion National Park, um, and then, gosh, we've done stuff for Korean tire manufacturers. Right? So uh, within the first couple of years of me you know, being employed here, um, they worked out uh, some negotiation or, or some uh, way for us to actually have a effectively a, a nonprofit production company, a production facility housed within the film department, within the communication department at that point, and now the, um, the visual and performing arts. And so we would take on clients, and that would allow us to, to bring in these jobs, work on them, take that money, and then put it back into the program to purchase equipment. Because uh, it... Uh, it's it's an expensive expensive endeavor. You know, you look at all the different art forms, and they're all you know, they're, none of them are cheap and uh, in any way, shape, or form. But this one in particular, it's very very costly. It's it's a huge industry, and uh, anything you purchase is if there's film anywhere attached to it, it you know, multiply it by four or five, it's going to be super expensive. But right. Um, yeah. So that, does that, that it, it yeah. does that? That was an unfair question to me to yeah. start with. That was rather <laughs> broad. And now we're going to do in writing parlance a mm -hmm. flashback. Here. Okay. We're going to go back. We know where you've been mm -hmm. for the last 10, 11 years. Where are you from? Are you a Utah oh. native or? Uh, no. Well, technically, no. I was I was born in uh, northern Wyoming mm -hmm. and a little town called Buffalo. And I lived That's there. appropriate for Wyoming. Yeah. I'd say. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I lived there for about a year, and then we moved to Idaho, then we moved to Michigan, and then we came here when I, I think I was five. Mm -hmm. And I've been here, not ever since, but effectively ever since. I, and and so I consider this my home, even though I've, I've you know, born in Buffalo, born in Wyoming, I haven't been there in quite some time. And I still have family there, but mm -hmm. it's, yeah, it's a long way away, and I just don't get back there much. So St. George is definitely my home. I've tried to move away multiple times, <laughs> uh, but there's something about this place from a a, a, a visual uh, standpoint that is incredibly appealing. Uh, it's intoxicating and, and it's addicting too. You you get it inside you, and and there's it's always changing, especially you know this time of year. You get outside right. in the summer where the uh, the sun stops shining a little bit. You know we have 360 days of summer, or say 360 days of sunshine supposedly. Right. And uh, or 300 days of sunshine. Sorry, I'm getting my stats all wrong. But that's okay. Uh, you know those other 65 days, they're they're pretty incredible, um, and it's more than that, obviously. But anytime you you get a, a change in light or change in anything, and the whole landscape takes a different uh, takes on a different shape and a different vibe, and you go, oh man, how can I capture that? And you, n I'll never be able to. No one will ever be able to. And that's it's the carrot. That this place dangles in front of you, You're like oh, there there might be something. So and and so you just you just stay here and you just you know keep trying. But um, it really is a, an incredible place uh, from that perspective, and that's kind of what has kept me here. I've lived other places. I've lived out of the country. I've lived up north, and and yeah, it's just this is definitely home. And not to say I'll live here forever, but you know for now I'm uh, pretty happy here. So. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, you, you lost me a while ago. Not really, but you lost me when you said go out in the summer. That's just uh, not my <laughs> not my speed at all. I'll tell you. Yeah. No, it, it's pretty brutal. I actually, because uh, uh, I I'm, I practice photography as well. I in, um, dabble in that, 
And uh, I'm actually trying to finish up an MFA in photography. Hopefully, this oh, good for you. May, yeah. Oh boy, what a what an endeavor that's been. But I'm I'm going to finish that up in May. And so the I actually started a thesis project a while back, and it all was sort of bred out of me trying to find a way to photograph in the summer heat without being in the summer heat. And so I started photographing by moonlight. Uh-huh. And so every full moon phase, I get out and you get four or five nights of full moon and you can actually use that to photograph by. And so that's, I've been, that's been a three-year project and I'm wrapping that up. Yeah. And it's really quite something because you're out there and it's still warm, but you're not under that direct radiant heat of the sunshine and, and so you can actually handle it and you get some incredible stuff it's it's really really cool so yeah well that's right you mentioned that you're finishing up mm-hmm. uh, an mfa program and i'm assuming that started three years ago oh no gosh or, i've been, uh, I've been quite a while, yeah, huh? i've been doing yeah i've been doing that for quite some time too long actually um they uh it, it, it's a long story but i yeah i've been doing it quite a while it, it just due to the nature of the, the costs associated with an mfa and then the time requirements and the the time i put in here uh, it's, it's, you know, you take a class a semester, you know, it's three grand a, a class. It's, uh, the Academy of Art in San Francisco have been doing that for like a long, long time. And, uh, yeah, but I'm, I'm very happy to be finishing, uh, be nearing uh, the end there. And, uh, yeah, and that will make me official and I'll actually be able to teach now, I guess. Right. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, so I don't know where I was going with that, but that's <laughs> yeah, the, the whole summer heat thing. Yeah. It, yeah. You really... There are about two and a half months here that it's really difficult to get outside. And so I've, you know, using um, technology because that has completely changed what we do uh, or opened up a lot of doors um, for us. Uh, using that to our advantage, you can actually go out and continue to, to visually, you know, create things visually, um, photographically, whatnot, uh, in the heat of the summer without just dying, you know, mm-hmm. everything going to hell in a handbasket, if you will. So, yeah. Well, there have been, uh, this is coming from a layman Mm -hmm. uh, as far as this. Like I said, in a lot of these mediums, I know enough to be dangerous, but Mm -hmm. that's it. Sure. Uh, Certainly not an expert. And I've always considered photographers Mm -hmm. to be different from filmmakers. Yeah. Uh, Mm -hmm. How does this intersect for you? Well, so it's it's fascinating. Um, once again, with technology, there's been a real fusion. You know, you find this this in in equipment. There's a a growing number of we'll call them hybrids, mm-hmm. right? Uh, cameras that will do both. Uh, wonderful. They'll, they'll, you can use them to create beautiful still images, and then you can use them to create beautiful motion picture images, right? So 24 frames a second. So you can shoot at one frame a second, mm-hmm. you know, or one frame an hour, one frame one just period, or you can shoot. 24 frames or 60 frames a second, which is pretty incredible. For example, uh, um, you know, what we worked on this this last weekend in that capacity, we were using a camera that is a stills camera. But, yeah. Yeah, right. yeah, I, yeah. I saw that. I, I was involved with that project in yeah. a minimum way. Mm-hmm. And I did see people walking around. I thought they were taking continuity pictures. They were taking frankly. continuity, but the, the the cameras we were using to film you, mm-hmm. that's a hybrid camera. That is that is a it's a wonderful stills camera. Uh, but it also does an incredible job of shooting motion picture stuff. So um, it all born out of this uh, demand from the prosumers, consumers, and even professionals. To, hey, we want to be able to shoot digitally, um, and but not be limited to these teeny little sensors, right? We want to have the aesthetic of film, you know, a larger uh, acquisition device, like a larger uh, format that way, um, but be able to do it digitally. And so... There's, there's been a revolution in the past seven, eight years where this technology has uh, kind of just um, disseminated, you know, across uh, across the board from consumer to professional mm-hmm. and made more and more of this stuff available. So suddenly, for example, that camera we were shooting on, that's a $1,400 camera, uh, but it shoots better well, digital video, digital film than cameras that were you know top of the line thirty thousand dollar cameras that we purchased five years ago right right that's that's how fast the technology is progressing and, and what it's doing the um, what it's opening up for uh creators creatives students professionals is just mind-boggling it's it's really incredible well i think so. it's uh i'm not sure if it's a good thing or a bad thing overall uh, and, and maybe both. <laughs> yeah. But I'll tell you, with these iPhones, yeah. uh, Adam Mast and I talked mm-hmm. about the fact that movies are being shot on yeah. iPhones now. Yeah. Um, what you're able to do with just an iPhone. Mm-hmm. And 
even I, I am not a photographer mm -hmm. by any means. In fact, uh, my wife, Christina, who is usually sitting in the chair right mm -hmm. next to me for this show, uh, she will tell you that she no longer or very rarely will ask me to take pictures at events. <laughs> uh, she just says, she says very openly, you yeah. suck at this, and, <laughs> which is okay. Uh, but I will tell you, she needed a new headshot mm -hmm. for some projects that she has coming up. And she was she needed them pretty quickly, so she handed me her iPhone mm -hmm. and said, "Let's let's try some angles." We looked at some headshots that yeah. uh, you know existed. We had uh, you shoot a few, oh, yeah, yeah. and we were mm -hmm. looking for kind of an action pose, mm -hmm. and we didn't really have that, so we went out in, in the woods. Yeah, and your shots that you did of her were were beautiful. They look like a professional did this. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, I just took an angle shot. Mm -hmm. And it actually turned out really good. Dude, I'll what tell you. Yeah. So there's, you know, optical photography. And then now there's, it's basically computational photography. Uh -huh. And what Google um, and Apple are doing in that world is, it's almost scary. Like what they're able to pull off in, in simulating, for example, a uh, depth of field, you know. Uh -huh. uh, so, okay, well, we want to be able to isolate our subject. We're going to put this in portrait mode. And all of a sudden, you know, that background is falling away and we're able to push our subject. We create plasticity, you know, so our subject moves forward in, in the frame, you know, so to speak, in, in, this, in this composition. And there's separation between our subject and the background and our eyes are drawn to that subject. And you couldn't do that with that size of sensor. That sensor is minuscule. It's smaller than your fingernail, right? Right. It, it, optically, it's impossible. You just can't pull that off, right? Without some crazy adapters and then going back to actual larger format lenses. But to be able to do what they're doing and simulate that look and then and, and go in and computationally, okay, well, here's our character. Right. And <laughs> and then uh, use distances and detection and whatnot and then just, you know, general algorithms. I say general. There's nothing general. They're incredibly specific uh, to go through, cut that subject out, even hair. And that's getting better and better all the time. Like fine hair, they're actually able to, you know, like mask mat around that and give you a simulated depth of field. It's shocking and, and scary, too, because suddenly you know, all these photographers that, well, this was our bread and butter. Oh, gosh, everyone's doing it with their phone now because everyone has a phone. Everyone's paying, you know, whatever they have to to get these phones that are the most versatile tools that we've seen in, you know, uh, in past three generations. Like, it's, right. it's really incredible. Um, that said, it's, it's exciting, too, because it opens up um, that world for a lot of people. Now, um, it's definitely a case of quantity over quality because there's a whole lot of photography out there. And there's not a lot of very good photography. Well, I, I take that's that's unfair. There, there's a lot of really good photography, mm -hmm. but there's not a lot of great photography. And well, I that, think you that can quantity. take good pictures, but aren't necessarily yes. great art. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, that's something I've been like I pondering the the past little while. Well, quite a while. You know, the the democratization of the photographic and motion picture or film world due to this technology has really kind of brought that topic front and center um in, in a lot of we'll say professionals minds because like what you know it, it's confusing like mm -hmm. now everyone can do it well geez um but it, can they that's, that's, a that's question. true so yeah. when, when i say that the barrier of entry used to be incredibly high right because it was film mm -hmm. if you wanted to do that you had to get a film camera and film is mm -hmm, right. is very very costly and by the way what he did is he just made the international money yeah. sign <laughs> yeah. with that it's very very expensive uh to be able to shoot and develop that the cameras required to do that the the crew's required to do that. Now, uh, going back, I'm going to backtrack a little bit. You, you, you mentioned that uh, there are filmmakers out there making films with iPhones. Now, um, and for example, they just had, uh, oh gosh, iPhone just came out with their, you know, their new, what, 11 or whatever. And they, they had a, um, like a rollout video, like a snowball fight. And this is this crazy action right. sequence shot and directed it was shot on an iPhone, directed by Chad, what's his name, from the John Wick series, which is his high-octane, high-intensity action, you know, director. And he brought it uh, to this little venue with, uh, you know, these kids having this incredibly uh, cinematic snowball fight. Um, now, you'll notice if you look at the behind the scenes, yes, they were shooting on an iPhone. And they got some beautiful images, but they also had a huge crew. Right. Right. So it's still in the end. There's uh, some things have changed, but some things stay the same. It takes a lot. Of, it takes a village, right, to roll that out. I mean, for example, the the number of kids we had out working on our little shoot, you know, over the weekend. Right. You have a, a large number of people. It's so much more than the technology. So much more than that. Now, um, 
like I said, it does lower the barrier of entry. So suddenly a bunch of college kids can get their university kids can get together with their instructors and, okay, well, we're going to do this now and we're going to make it look good. Right. And that the right. possible, but now because the possibility is there now, that's incredibly encouraging, right? Because now you can compete uh, as far as image quality goes with anyone. Like you can pull a $1,400 camera out and if you light it correctly and shoot it correctly, it will look just every bit as good as something that, you know, was shot on a $100,000 camera. Well, it might look good, but can you make a movie? Can you make a movie? That's something entirely different. Yeah, that, the, the two are not, yeah, or whatever, mutually exclusive. So, And actually, we are going to get a little bit more into that. Mm -hmm. As far as you talked about the crew, I would like to talk more about that yeah. as an actor. Um, I came to realize very quickly mm -hmm. uh, in several of my other film projects, whereas the actor is extremely important on mm -hmm. the stage, the actor is pretty low there on the whole priority list mm -hmm. as far as making a film. And we can certainly yeah. chat about that. Yeah. I do want to let you know that we are heading up to a break right okay. now. Uh, the time always flies with this. And please know you can check us out what we look like on Radio St. George. We are broadcasting live right now on Facebook and also on YouTube. Now, these shows will also be archived. You can see me nodding very knowledgeably when terms like optimization and opticization and things like that are being used. Uh, again, I'm an actor acting like I know what the heck I'm listening to. But stay tuned. We're going to have a few announcements, some weather, and we'll be right back with On the Arts. This is Henry Fogel inviting you to join me for the next edition of Collector's Corner, which will be the third in a series of four programs featuring all of the symphonies by Ettore Villalobos with the Sao Paulo Symphony Orchestra conducted by Isaac Karabchevsky. The symphonies numbers 8, 9, and 10 on the next edition of Collector's Corner. I hope you'll be with me. Collector's Corner, Mondays from 11 till 1, on Radio St. George 100.3. Outdoor furniture to endure the desert climate. Comfort, easy maintenance, custom made for your home. Outdoor Living. Located at 735 South Bluff Street in St. George, Outdoor Living offers in-home consultation and design for custom outdoor furniture. Outdoor Living, a proud sponsor of the radio program here at Dixie State University. My son had a drinking problem at college. I'm glad a friend suggested Al-Anon Family Groups. If someone's drinking troubling you, you might be surprised at what you can learn in an Al-Anon Family Group from people just like you. Call 1-888-4-AL-ANON or go to al .org. This is Hannah with your Radio Dixie Calendar for Tuesday, November 19th. From 12 to 1.30 p.m., International Student Services Languages of the World is in the Gardner Living Room. From 4 to 5 p.m., Interview Like a Pro is in the Holland Building, room 537. And from 7.30 to 9 p.m., there is a brass concert in Eccles 129. And that's your calendar on Radio Dixie 91.3. Enjoy our content anytime. Subscribe to our podcast. Search for Radio St. George on podbean.com. Welcome back to Radio St. George 100.3 with On The Arts. And now your hosts, Michael and Christina Hardy. Welcome back to On The Arts. We're now getting ready for our second segment. And uh, just a reminder to those out there, this is On The Arts, uh, dedicated to blowing the lid off of all of these little artistic secrets that we have here in Southern Utah. And the main secrets being the people that we have here with an incredible list of accomplishments as well as incredible backgrounds and incredible goals. Now, I was talking to our guest today, Ben Brayton, over this break, talking about how one of the great things is we get to know things we didn't know necessarily about people. And I had no idea that you were finishing up an MFA in photography, which I think is absolutely fantastic. Now, I do want to steer our conversation. I mentioned earlier that you could see me nodding very knowledgeably if you check us out on Facebook at Radio St. George or on The Arts with Michael and Christina Harding, either uh, on Facebook, and this show will be archived, or you can check us out on YouTube. We are streaming live right now, and that will be archived as well. You can see my acting, nodding knowledgeably. You can also see when Ben makes an international money sign or something like that on the radio. But uh, I do want to steer the conversation just a little bit to these different roles that take place on a film set. Like in, in this project that we were talking about this weekend, I did uh, a short scene that I was, it was a pleasure being a part of it. It was a lot of fun. 
But I also watched Ben walk around as the director. I watched him work with students. I watched students who were carrying all of these little gadgets that I had no idea what they were doing. I got to put on a microphone. I felt like I was wired for the mob a little bit. I was wearing my wire. Now, Ben, you were the director. What is your job as a director? Okay, well, first off, I have to state um, that if you, if, <laughs> if you ever come on one of our sets and and you know see me working... Uh, it, don't take that as, you know, a, a definition of what a director does. Definitive first, director. Yeah, yeah. Because first of all, um, you, that that would be a terrible, you know, uh, case study like following me around. Um, but second of all, I have to wear a lot of hats because this is they're student productions, right? And and even though yes, I am, we'll say, helming them. Mm -hmm. Um, the. It's for the most part, it's students. Like just about everyone on that set, uh, maybe there were four people who were in faculty advisor, you know, positions, and the 25, 30 other people there were were students. And so it's it's a learning environment. And so, and by the though, way, he's not kidding. Twenty five to thirty other people there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and they're like I said, they're all students, and they're all working hard and having fun, and hopefully learning, you know, as as we go about it. So. Uh, so <laughs> there's a lot of responsibility that falls on, well, you know, for, for example, my shoulders, um, because, you know, you, you have a lot of different departments. Like, once again, it takes a village. And to, to create these things, I mean, there's you have everything from the camera department, obviously. And that's that's an obvious one that everyone, oh, well, obviously you have a camera. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we have a camera department. And those camera departments range and vary in sizes and shapes um, depending on the production and the budget. Right. We have no budget. And, but we still, we flesh it out. And um, it, you saw me running one of the cameras. Well, that's just one of the things I have to do. Now, typically a director would never touch the camera, right? Mm -hmm. they, they're not going to do that. Like that's your, uh, that is your camera operator's job. And that's what he or she does exclusively, right? They're in, in Hollywood, particularly on union sets, the exclusivity right is is the name of the game like you do your job and that is it right we don't have that luxury here and so you, you're going to see a lot of people doing a lot of different things we have to in order to cover all the bases get everything done a lot of people have to do a lot of different things that they just wouldn't have to ordinarily and that's okay for in, in my in my opinion uh, it makes you uh, a better more comprehensive um, student of the uh, the craft as well as just a better craftsman in general, if you understand how these things work, right? You don't have to um, be an expert on all of them, but if you understand how they all come together, you, you get a, a larger or a more comprehensive vision of the whole process, and and uh, I think that helps just in general. I, I'm um, going to give you an opportunity to teach here for a second. What okay. the heck is a key grip? I see that. So, so for example, the uh, a key grip is going to be in charge of any time... You, you have to, for example, move the camera, right? They, like if, if it needs to go on a dolly, on a jib, anything like that, all these physical components. It, basically, um, you could equate camera or uh, film crews to construction crews, right? There's a whole lot of manual labor. Uh, they're just typically higher paid and maybe they, they well, they, they work longer hours um, for the most part. And they probably eat worse food. Right. Yeah, so, <laughs> uh, so a key grip. There's it's, it's a very very physical position. Like I said, they've got a. Uh, they're going to move these. Um, it, if you have to move the camera, for example, uh, if it needs to go on a dolly, on on a jib, on a crane, anything like that, they're going to be responsible for that. But there are a whole lot of other things that they have to do as well, and and they're going to work hand in hand typically with electrical. You've got these stands that have to go up. You saw that we had. Um, some some large stands outside the window, for example. Right. Uh, those all have to be moved, erected, um, and or assembled. And in this case, where there's a lot of crossover between, we'll say, key grip and then the gaffer, the the head electrician, right? And and those two typically work hand in hand, um, in, in my experience. And uh, because most of that is a fusion of the two, like there there has to be something to place these electrical elements on, these lighting elements on. And if we have to move them, then that's that falls into one domain versus striking them and and powering them. That's the other. But they, like I said, they all sort of work hand in hand. Um, so the the key grip is is a very physical position. Um, and then they have their assistants, 
And uh, typically, like you said, on larger sets, you're going to have a specific uh, dolly grip. Now, we didn't have the, the, the time or luxury to pull out a dolly for what we were doing. There just wasn't space. Considering right. the set we were working with, it wasn't going to work out. But if, uh, if we did, there, there was a, a dolly involved, and there would be a dolly grip, for example, and that works under, under the key grip uh, there. So once again, moving the camera. Um, and then you, like I said, you have your electrician, your, your gaffer, um, and they were going to work hand in hand with the director of photography, right? Who kind of oversees all of that, the, the general, uh, that look, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you're going to come up with a, a lighting plot, right? Okay. How do we want to light this? Where's the light going to come from? How do we motivate this in the set? And, you know, hopefully they're working with the set designer or art director, you know, in this case, we weren't able to design something. You had to work with practical locations, mm -hmm. but you had to still had to figure out where light is going to come from and how it's going to fit in and, and, and whatnot and give you the look that you're going for. So there's just a, there's a lot involved uh, that way. Um, that sort of answer your question? It does okay. very much. Well, and so, and so going back to, I guess what you'll, you'll see me do is I've got to go over uh, and, and, sort of direct or, or check in with every department, right? Okay, so audio, and audio is its own department, and right. there's a whole lot that goes into that. It, it's sort of like the, the black arts or the dark arts of, you know, the, <laughs> the industry. Like, they just, you just let them do their thing and just, you know, whatever. But it's a great, great occupation. Like, they they get in and they do their job and they're very quiet and they, you know, it's like better, uh, like, you don't want to see them, you don't want to hear them. They're just there and doing their thing sort of thing. And, and uh Anyway, they, uh, uh, they're, <laughs> anytime you go wireless, right? Anytime you have to transmit a signal, receive a signal, place a microphone on an actor, you know, something, there's going to be something that goes wrong. It, it's just inherent in, in what you're doing. And so with these kids working on this, they, they do a really good job, but you still, you got to check in with them. You got to check in with camera. You got to check in. I'm checking in with my key grip and my, my gaffer, making sure everything's going that way because you've got answers that have to be, or so you have to, you have questions that have to be answered all the time. It's a never ending list of, of uh, questions. And uh, with filmmaking, the devil is in the details mm -hmm. very much, right? Like if you don't get the, de if you don't take care of the details, you will not take, you know, make your film. Like it just doesn't right. work. It, it won't come together. You'll lack continuity and the whole thing just kind of becomes a shambles. Um, so, but typically on a set, um, the director will be directing. He'll be working with the actors and checking in with the director of photography. Okay, yeah, that's that's how we, we want to block this out. This is how we want the actors to, to move within the set, within the scene, uh, to give us uh, the, the right pacing, the right beats, the right emotional impact that, right. that we're looking for. So much like a, a director would in, in theater. Although in theater, and, and, and I do love theater, like I, it, musical theater... Uh, in particular, for some reason, don't I? It's fun. Yeah, I. I or big, I should say. It is it's big. Effective. It's big. It's yeah. It it is very much yeah. And I've done a whole lot of work with Tuacon over the years, and so in fact, one of um, I I made a documentary um, that you can check out on the Utah K U. I believe it's K U D P B S. Um, mm -hmm. They're showing that like uh, several times a year for the next I think two and a half years. Great. Um, up there on on Tuacon, called Miracle and Padre Can we. Uh, the, the University of DSU Films took that on, and, and uh, so I um, shot, directed, and edited that, and uh, nearly killed me. That was a that was a huge <laughs> endeavor. That was very very intense uh, trying to put that all together in, in a timely fashion. Um, and once again, it's a, you know the devil into details, like trying to get take care of all of those different things. It's very very stressful, right? And, <laughs> and cortisol uh, induced. Yeah, anyway, um, but. The, the devil being in the details, uh, a director will focus on what he or she has to do, right? And they'll let the director of photography focus on what he or she has to do. And typically, when it comes to managing a set, you have an assistant director. You have a UPM, you know, production manager that's it's covering even beyond that. But that's where the, the, the production um, department comes in. And so the, the assistant director is going to go around. In fact, so we had a, a student named Lane, and he was going around checking in with everyone. Okay, how are you doing? How are you doing? How are you doing? Okay. Now, even though he necessarily wasn't necessarily able to 
answer their questions, he could bring it back to me and say, right. you know, this is what's going on uh, sort of thing. And he's uh, an assistant director is responsible for making sure we stay on task and making sure we stay on time, making right. sure we make our days. Right. And in this case, we, we finished an hour and a half early, or hour and 15 minutes early, which was terrific. Right. You know? And so everyone's happy when you can end early. And, and so a happy crew is a crew that will stay motivated and keep coming back, you know, right. keep working, <laughs> especially on student productions. And you have to keep them happy, you know, like, you, know, you work too long and go, you know, do too many days where you're going beyond the, the time and you start to burn bridges and kids don't want to come back. So you have to stay, stay on top of things. But, um, yeah. So like I said, don't take what I do as this is the, the, the typical or prototypical, you know, role because it's not at all. I've got mm -hmm. a lot of hats to wear, but typically a director's hat is they're going to, they're in charge of picking the right people. Uh, you know, working with the actors to, to make sure everything is, is flowing uh, in a succinct and consistent manner, right? Be, to to g give the right tone, and then they sort of they can get out of the way and just watch, and then make corrections. Now, every director is completely different, and right. they all take different approaches. But in a perfect, in my perfect world, that's that's what it would be. All right, okay, step back, let these people do what they're great at, and and that really, I mean, if you ask anyone, like that's picking the right people to put in front of the camera and behind the camera. That's that's the real job right there. Like if you can do that and do that effectively and consistently, then you'll be in good shape. You can, you know, get a whole lot done. Um, and your lifespan in that career will be a lot longer than the people who, oh, gosh, we constantly have, we're having to correct things, right, <laughs> and, and make up for we didn't get the right people, you know. So, right. um, yeah, but I think there are a lot of similarities between that and, you know, theatrical direction. Uh, although it's, uh, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but my takeaway from my you know, time working in theater. And I had this dream to, to write a, a, a stage play uh -huh. and, and actually get it produced one of these days. But I think that would be a lot of fun. Um, but uh, my, my interaction and my time with them is that, okay, well, you know, up and like the director is very intensive, very hands-on up through rehearsals. And then from then on, it's the, the actor's game, right? right? They do their thing and it's wonderful because no, no, um, night is the same as the night before and it's, it's very much this live thing now on on uh, on a film the director has to see you know it through from beginning to end right right and the actors come in they do their thing and it's great you get the performance you want and then the director is going to go into the edit with the editor and going to craft and fine-tune that performance and change the timing change the tone all that stuff right. so you get fit exactly in inside his or her vision and uh so it's a, it's a Different in that way, but it's still you're overseeing. You you want the the tone to be correct, right? So. Also, as an actor in this mm -hmm. process, I mentioned that I'm a stage actor, mm -hmm. and I will say that's what gives me sweaty palms mm -hmm. more than anything. Is you're absolutely right that in uh, the theater, you know, the director's there for the rehearsal and such, and sometimes they'll come back. Yeah, but you're you're allowed to take the piece that you've created and yeah. within boundaries, sure, to live it yeah. every night and to do what feels right and mm -hmm. such. I have to say, uh, as an actor, quite often you'll be told, okay, now on this line, you need to turn and, mm -hmm. and what have you. And for continuity's sake, yeah. you've got to keep that the same. Mm -hmm. And I find that's a constant thing that I'm fighting mm -hmm. is I'm thinking, ooh, another choice. Maybe I'll turn yeah. here. <laughs> and I think, oh, shoot, no, I can't do yeah. that. Uh, it, it is definitely an interesting experience. Yeah. Now, when I was doing a film, I was doing a film. Mm -hmm. no, I was an extra mm -hmm. uh, in this film. Yeah. It was the substitute part four. Okay. With Treat Williams. <laughs> oh, uh, I and, diggity. All right. And, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, this guy played Stanley Kowalski. Yeah, yeah. And when I saw him, I mean, little teeny guy. Yeah. Nice guy, but, mm -hmm. you know, little teeny guy. Yeah. And I was amazed at some of the trickery that was being used in filming this. Sure. Now, we it was being filmed on a college campus, mm -hmm. a fictional college campus in Colorado. And they wanted the appearance of a lot of students. There were about 15 of us mm -hmm. extras. And this was a rather lengthy scene, uh, Treat Williams and whoever his co-star was. I, yeah. I wasn't familiar with their work. But I was amazed that they had three people, mm -hmm. uh, and they had the headsets on and everything, the official. And we basically formed a pyramid around this scene. Mm -hmm. You know, We weren't too close. But those three, they were kind of like umpires or coaches on uh, the baseball field. Sure. They would say, you two, come. And they were just you know, motioning to mm -hmm. us, walk by here, walk by here. And when I went back and looked at the scene, it looked like there were students yeah. everywhere. And you're seeing the same people cross in yeah. front of the camera, behind the camera. They were just passing us around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I noticed uh, even in the shoot that we did last weekend, mm -hmm. 
we had what about eight or nine uh, extras, maybe maybe a dozen. No, yeah, I think we had between twelve and fifteen. That's yeah. a, uh-huh. it, it, a small group yep. or, or relatively small group. Mm-hmm. And I noticed that the same particular scene that I was shooting, mm-hmm. you would do it from one angle and they'd all be behind me. Mm-hmm. Then we do it at another angle and you'd take some that were in the back yep. uh, on that first shot and put them up there. I imagine this is going to look like we have, you know, 50 to 60 people. That's the hope. Yeah. 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 <laughs> exactly. Now, as far as continuity with faces and where they're supposed to be, you know, we didn't have the, the luxury of time to switch costumes out and stuff. And, and typically you would in something like that. Uh, and so hopefully people don't pay too close attention to right. that. But, you know, it is... It, it is what it is. So, right. um, but ideally, yeah, you would go through and, and if you, um, with, with time, you would go through switch costumes and, and, and whatnot. And that's the beauty of, of film, right? It, it, uh, and the beauty of the edit, mm-hmm. like it's not a, a one take thing, although that in it has become sort of a, I don't want to say a trend, but that's, if you're going to do like, you know, one takes or, or, or you know, continuous shots uh, or a continuous shot like throughout an entire film, for example, like the Birdman's and, and, and whatnot, these long, long... The Silent House, I think, was one of them. Or yeah, like... and, and now, so for example, 1917, which is mm-hmm. coming out uh, on Christmas. I'm very excited to see that. But that that is a way for filmmakers to flex their muscle and see and say, you know what, I don't need the artifice and the trickery of the edit. I can do this and pull this off you know, without any help and, you know, wow you with that. And uh, it is pretty amazing. But for the most part, when you don't have a giant budget and you have to make, you know, 15 people look like 60 people, that's where the the edit comes in. Okay, we're going to change angles, right? Right. In the, in the, Walter Murch calls it the blink of an eye, right? Where you blink, right? And now we're we're looking somewhere different. And, and that's also part of the beauty and the, and the craft of uh, film is that you can – you know, time things out and crescendo and, and, you know, peak. And then we're going to drop down a little bit with the edit and, and show the, the audience exactly what you want to see, want, want them to see or, or hear mm-hmm. um, at, at certain points. And, and that, that crafting in post, in post-production is, is a, <laughs> it's strenuous, but it's also really, really kind of magical because it's where all of these disparate pieces sort of come together and they, become hopefully a, a very cohesive um fluid you know whole or right you know, um single piece there and it really is incredible what happens as you just it, it's a lot like finished carpentry you have this rough you know outline and then you just keep going over layer after layer after layer putting all the pieces in this glue this this you know uh, bit of um, consistency that j- just ties everything together right and that's really really fun that for me is just a very um <sighs> Very creatively fulfilling, I guess mm-hmm. we'd say, you know, because you can create um, reality, you know, or perceive reality from utter nonsense. Right. You know, and utter chaos. You just take these little pieces. All right. Well, if you do it right, then suddenly it's, it's all believable, you know. So well, that's I had a really good time with one shot, particularly. Mm-hmm. Uh, not one shot. There were several different angles, but you were working with uh, Patrick, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. who was playing uh, the lead role in this, yeah. as a matter of fact. And what was a lot of fun is you were doing a lot of shots of me. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. A, a lot of shots of me. <laughs> but uh, you were getting some reaction shots from mm-hmm. him. And what was great is I was just sitting off camera, yep. you know, just kind of marking through the lines and mm-hmm. such. And I was watching you as a director getting certain reactions out of him. Mm-hmm. And it was just fun to start thinking about what is the final product going to look like? Yeah. When is the camera going to change? When yeah. is the shot going to change? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think it's just a hoot. When I'm watching this thing, it's the same thing when you're doing audio. I do a lot of audio books and such. Oh, okay. I'll yeah. remember mm-hmm. what I was thinking about. I'm thinking about, oh, I really want to go to McDonald's after this or something. <laughs> and I'll listen to the actual track, and it yeah. sounds like I'm totally engaged in what yeah. I'm saying. And that just fascinates me yeah. To if you know what's behind the scenes. Manipulating reality. Yeah. That's, that's all it is. It's, it's just a lot of trickery and a lot of nonsense. It, it really is. But... Man, like you said, when it comes together, there's a, a very real sense of fulfillment, you know, right. going, okay, well, we created something that's a lot of fun and, and cohesive and makes sense. A story, we've told a story out of all these very disparate pieces, you know. Right. And, you know, the world of narrative filmmaking, narrative storytelling is is similar to documentary filmmaking, but completely different in that, you know, you go into a narrative with a very defined script, or hopefully a very defined script. You know what it's supposed to look like, right? Right. And you create those pieces and put it together according to that bl- you know blueprint, that outline. With a documentary, you're basically shaping these pieces of the puzzle as you go, 
and then assembling it without having any idea what it's supposed to look like. Right. Right. It, it's it's completely up in the air, completely up to you. And so there's a lot of you know creative freedom that way, but it's also a bit daunting and, and mm-hmm. kind of intimidating. Like, I have no idea where this is supposed to go. Uh, but uh, you, you find the story and then let that kind of kind of shape it there. So a lot, m- much of uh, documentary production, even more of that happens in, in the edit, right? right? Than, than, you would, than it does in, in a narrative film. Although in, in, both, um, in both disciplines, both art forms, the edit is critical, right? It, this is what I, I talk to my students about this because uh, po- I teach post-production as well. Right. Um, I think every best actor and best actress and best, you know, whatever should get up as they accept their, um, their award, should get up and thank the editor. Right. Because the editor can make or break a performance, right? They can, you just get the timing or the pacing wrong just a little, I mean, just by a couple frames. And suddenly uh, it goes from powerful to parody. Right. Right. In just the blink of an eye, like it, it really is incredible. Um, how much, uh, how how significant uh, the, an effect an editor, a great editor, can have um, on a performance, and oftentimes you have to create performances out of maybe not great performances, you know. And there's so much power in that edit and what you're able to do. You can scrub audio, clean things up, you know. Maybe visually it was a terrific performance, but acoustically, you know, the the delivery. Right wasn't great right it was actually coming out what you're hearing didn't fit so you can actually go through and find <laughs> some, another take i'd had to do this many times find another take where the audio where the you know visually it didn't work but the the audio was terrific and you match it up and no one is the wiser no one can tell right. but in the end you've created a much uh a much better perform- performance right and a, and a better you know piece in general and that right. happens all the time like all the time, right? So it it really is. Uh, it's just yeah, you're creating reality out of chaos and nonsense. So well, that was uh, actually something that really surprised me mm-hmm. about film. Just as a young actor, there were actors I really admired up mm-hmm. there on the screen. And as I started to learn, not necessarily becoming an expert or having a lot of experience with, but I started to learn about that. I started to look at their performances differently. Yeah, and uh, you know, wondering, well, how many takes did that take, mm-hmm. or you know. Was I psychologically manipulated there yeah. to look away? Yeah. Now, Ben, as always happens with this show, we're practically out of time. Well, oh my uh, gosh! Okay, no, <laughs> it you're really right. Does fly. Uh, Good grief! But I do want to thank you very much for coming well, thank on. You, yeah. And uh, I'd love to have you on again to talk, you know, about photography and such. Yeah. I didn't oh, I'd know love what's to. going on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That would be a lot of fun. That uh, I, I do film, but photography is technically I'm qualified to talk about photography, where <laughs> film is just you know <laughs> experience. So anyway, yeah, that'd be great. Gotcha. I definitely look forward to that. Uh, I will say, if you want to find out more about what Ben is doing or what Dixie State is doing with film, uh, or even if you want to find out what's going on with FMASU, uh, with Adam Mast, there's a lot to be found out. Just check us out here on On The Arts uh, on Facebook. We do have a page. You can also certainly leave a message there. We'll give you some information. If you ever want to see Ben, I will say, just come here to the Jennings Communication Building and look for Audrey Hepburn looking at you. Uh, He's got a big picture of her in his office. But until you hear from us again in Season 5 on January 7th at 4 p.m., we hope that you have a great holiday season and keep your focus on the arts. You've been listening to On the Arts with Michael and Christina Harding. Search Facebook, YouTube, Podbean, Spotify for Radio St. George to view video and podcasts of this show or go to RadioStGeorge.com. Join us Tuesdays and Thursdays at 4 for On the Arts on Radio St. George 100.3.